Hello and welcome to my presentation on fast charging of lithium-ion batteries. I'm Jan Lichter, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Petimo. You know that fast charging is a crucial feature to make electric vehicles finally successful. So let's get into the details. Why is it so challenging to develop fast charging strategies? Well, before you fast charge a car, it sees different driving scenarios. And when you then fast charge, the faster you charge, the higher the aging risk becomes. This goes to an extreme if you go in below 15 minutes. In my presentation today, I want to show you how you can perfectly balance aging risk and charging time and reducing the aging risk while at the same time reducing the charging time. I want to start with some fundamentals on battery remodeling before I introduce the fast charging strategy. I then show you how you can use CarMaker to get the battery at a certain state and follow up with the fast charge. I close my presentation with a short summary. How do you get a battery model? There are different approaches and you can see them on the slide. Um, I used a graph to show that the higher the effort that you put into the model is, the higher the accuracy becomes. There are very simple models that are just based on a heat source um, and they are in general not used in an automotive context. If you make it a little bit more complicated, you end up with equivalent circuit-based models that uh, consist of like an open circuit voltage source and inner resistances, our elements, and so on. And all of these quantities can be lookup tables of inner state variables. The problem is that these models are still linear and cannot describe um, the battery in the full operational area, especially in an automotive context. And that's why more complicated and more accurate models are needed. And these are either electrochemical models or, if you go even further, microstructural models that really calculate the battery equations on the real microstructure of an electrode. The problem there is, and that's what you see on the slide, is that if you go farther than level two, the effort becomes really, really high to generate such a model. And this is exactly where we as Petimo come in. We take care of that. So we ensure that the effort on your side is really low and we create high precision, physical, parameterized and validated battery cell models. Three things are really important in that context and I already mentioned them. Our model is physical. It's specifically parameterized for the cell that you used and we demonstrate validity and really prove that the model is correct. Because these, these three things are so important, let's go through them step by step. What does physicality mean? I already mentioned that you have these very simple level one equivalent circuit based models and they are like kind of standard in the automotive sector in, in many companies. They are cool because you can parameterize them really fast or just fit them to some pulse measurements. They simulate really fast. Um, the model that you see in the slide only has two state variables. So you can easily implement that on any microcontroller and they're very easy to handle. However, they are linear and they are unprecise. A battery is not a resistance and RC element. It's way more complicated. Also, covering aging with these types of models is difficult. And the reason is that the different aging mechanisms mix differently in the parameters depending on the aging state. If you go to the other extreme, you have those microstructural models. And that's what we did in our PhDs. Parameterization is extensive, takes several months. The reason is you have to open up cells and uh, create the microstructure from the electrodes. Simulation time is, is hours for a simple discharge and you really need a battery expert that just does nothing else in working with the model. You have to take care of mashing and stability of the solver, conversions and so on. So this is something that is done for is uh, needed in research, but it's way too complex and too slow to use this in a total vehicle simulation. And what did we do? Well, we combined the best of the two worlds together. We used the speed and the handling of the equivalent circuit-based models and combined it with the physicality and the precision of the microstructural models. So our model is physical in its core, but how do we make sure that it descri describes precisely your cell? There are basically two ways how you can end up with a parameterized model of exactly your cell. The first is just use a model of the Betimo cell library. That's basically a library of those validated models. Um, it, it's just like on a one-time access fee and you can get access to all of the models in the library. Regular updates with new cell at least twice annually um, are included. And as, and as you see on the slide, um, there are already quite a few um, automotive cells available. But let's say your cell is not in the library and you still need a model or you want to keep it confidential. 
Then we offer a service and create such a model specifically for you. We take care of all the me measurements, the parameterization, the validation, and you get the model back for the simulation environment that you want to use. So now we have, we have something cool, a parameterized model of exactly your cell. But to me, that's still totally worthless. Something very important is missing. If you base your design decisions on simulations and on models, you must be 100% sure that the underlying models are correct. And that's why we always demonstrate validity. Two things are really important in that aspect. The first is when we validate, it's totally transparent. We directly compare the measurement results to the simulation results and show you in detail how accurate the predicted voltage, energy, power, and temperature of the model is. The data is supplied as an Excel document, but we've also a visualization tool that allows you to precisely zoom in, zoom out, and move around and check how accurate the model is. The second thing is, if we validate, we validate extensively. It's very easy to generate a battery model for 25 degrees C and low currents. Any bachelor student can do that. It's tough to get a model that can describe the total operational area of the cell as it is used in an automotive context. When we validate, we validate everything from minus 20 degrees C all the way up to 80 degrees C the cell temperature, high pulse currents, low SOCs, and also high SOCs. And that's why we right now are quite confident. We even guarantee that. We guarantee that if you can show us a more precise cell model, we will give you your money back. And that's it for the modeling side. So now, how can we use those models um, in a fast charging strategy? And in order to understand that, I have, first of all, to give you some details on what the problem in fast charging really is. If you charge really fast, a problem that is called lithium plating occurs. So what is that? When you charge, you put lithium ions from the cathode into the anode, and the anode is usually made of graphite. So if too many lithium ions arrive at the anode surface at the same time, a side reaction happens. So the lithium ions do not get integrated into the graphite, but they react to metallic lithium at the um, anode surface. And there's the trigger for that. If you know the anode surface potential, you know if intercalation or lithium plating happens. And the trigger is the anode surface potential. If this is below zero, you get lithium plating. If this is above zero, intercalation happens. So if you have a valid model that can simulate the anode potential, then we could design a charging strategy that is optimal and drives the battery at the physical limit of the system just so that lithium plating does not occur. And that's the basic idea. So how does that look like? On the slide, you see a standard charge as indicated in the data sheet of the cell manufacturer. Um, you see that the current is constant at the beginning until the upper voltage limit is reached and then the current decays. In the plot below, you see the anode surface potential and it is way above uh, zero millivolts. So in this charge, lithium plating would not occur. But can we charge faster? Well, what are the limits in general? And there are four. The first is the maximum charger current that the charger can supply. The second is the maximum cell voltage that the cell can withstand. If you would exceed this voltage, um, the cell would age. The third is the maximal cell temperature. Again, if you would exceed those temperature, you would get side reactions and the cell would age. And the fourth is the one that I just introduced, is the minimum anode surface potential. So how can we derive a charging algorithm or a charging current that drives uh, the current precisely always at one of those limits? It's fairly um, simple. You just create a charging algorithm that knows the limits. It knows the voltage, the temperature, and the anode surface potential um, as calculated by a validated parameterized physical model. The controller then ensures that all of that the charging current is always as high as possible while ensuring that none of these limits um, is exceeded. The result of such a simulation is shown in orange in the graph. You see that the current is a lot higher at the beginning and then it decays in a certain way before the voltage limit is reached and the current decays back to zero. You see that the charge is significantly faster. Um, these uh, circles here indicate the 80% SOC point, and you can see that the charging time is almost cut by a third without causing additional aging because lithium plating is actively avoided. As you can see here, the anode surface potential stays 
always above zero. If you draw the respective limit um, in the graph, you see that at the beginning of the charging, we operate the cell at the max charging current, then at the minimum anode potential, and at the end, at the maximum cell voltage. So that's it from the theoretical background. Now let's implement this in practice and really use total car uh, vehicle simulations to back this up. So how can we do that? We basically couple car maker with Petimo cells. Um, you can get this done by using MATLAB as a simulation tool for coupling so that car maker and the Petimo cells run within Simulink. In the following slides, I want to show a driving scenario that is based on the Stelvio Pass uh, in the Alps um, and a standard uh, vehicle model that is available in, in CarMaker. The track itself is about 20 kilometers long. It goes like um, ab about uh, 1900 uh, meters in height, it goes up. So we drive from the valley all the way to the mountain top and the drive itself takes about 20 minutes. Um, the battery model that I want to use um, is the Sanyo um, GA uh, cell. That's an energy DC cell um, in, in, the, in the 18650 format. It has 2.5 amp hours of capacity. Um, and it's, it's a cell that is currently used in, in serious production uh, in, in energy applications. So if we drive uphill, I want to analyze two different scenarios. First is a summer scenario where we have an ambient temperature of 25 degrees C. And the second scenario is a winter scenario um, where we have minus 10 degrees C. I set the, the aging state of the cell uh, to two different levels. Um, one um, is a new cell and the second is the end of life cell. And if you start the simulation, you can see this in the video now, the car drives up um, the hill. And by doing so, we precisely use our model to calculate uh, the power that the battery can supply and how it heats up and how the state of charge is reduced. So at the end of the simulation, we precisely know the temperature of um, the battery pack, the SOC um, at the end of the simulation. And we could also determine um, if we need a certain derating strategy because the battery cannot supply the power to drive uphill. And this didn't happen in the summer scenario. And it even didn't happen for the new cell in the winner scenario. But for the aged cell in the winner scenario, we had to derate the power of the car um, so that it can fulfill this drive. And this is something really important that you have to keep in mind, even for, the, for so simple things as just like driving uphill, um, a certain derating strategy uh, for the power the battery can supply is totally uh, crucial. So at the end, we are uphill and we now know the precise state the battery is in after we are uphill. And at the top of the, of the pass, we want now to fast charge. And again, I want to compare four different scenarios. Um, in the summer, I always use the, use the new aging state. And at first, I want to immediately charge um, after I arrive at the top. And then the alternative is I want to go on a hike, um, enjoy the Alps there, and then charge after the hike. And the difference is the cell temperature at the beginning of my charge. If I charge immediately, I have like about uh, 37 degrees C because the, the pack is heated up from driving up. If I wait after the hike, my pack is cooled down again to 25 degrees C. Um, in the winter scenario, um, I always use the, the old state the, at the end of life. And again, I charge immediately after I arrive at the top or I go skiing and then charge after skiing when the pack is cooled down to minus 10 degrees C again. If you simulate that um, in MATLAB, um, I now show you the four limits that I introduced. So the current, uh, the voltage, the temperature, and the unsettled potential for this immediate charge um, in the summer. Um, again, you see at the beginning, you reach the current limit, then uh, you reach the temperature limit, so you have to decay the charging current because the cell is too hot, and then you reach the anode surface potential limit before hitting the voltage limit. So it's, it's very interesting that in this scenario, you really he uh, reach all of those four limits. So how does this change if you charge after the hike? Um, not that much, uh, because the temperature difference from uh, 37 to 25 degrees C of the cell is not too big. Nevertheless, you can charge a little faster because you hit the maximum temperature a little later. But what if it's winter and it's minus 10 degrees C? Um, so let's look at that. You can even charge faster than in the summer. And the reason is that the cell is still warm at the beginning of the charge so that you can really reach um, the, the, the maximum current and the anode cell potential does not limit you. You then uh, do not reach the uh, maximum temperature limit 
because it's cold outside and together with, with the cooling of your pack, you can really drive the cell um, at its limit. And that's how you really end up very fast at the, the voltage limit. And you see that in the winter, if the cell is warm, you can even charge faster. But what if I go skiing first and charge after the skiing so that my pack is cold? Yeah, then uh, it takes a lot, lot longer. Um, you see that I cannot even use the maximum current of the charger anymore because my, my anode service potential limits me and it drops down severely to about the 10 millivolts um, safety margin that I hold here. And this uh, significantly increases the charging time. And now I show you the, the charging times to put a certain amount of energy in the cell, um, which is like 24, uh, 42.7 kilowatt hours. It's like enough for about like a 200 kilometer um, drive. And you see that the charging time is almost about like 20 minutes all the time and identical, no matter how the scenario was before. And that's interesting. So even if it's winter and the battery is warm because you have you were driving before, charging time is not doesn't increase that much. But if the pack is cold, charging time increases a lot, like to about an hour to get the same amount of energy in. And I think now you immediately understand why coupling of driving scenarios together with fast charging is so important. Depending on what the driver did before the fast charge, where he charges, how the environmental conditions are, the charging algorithms um, change a lot to reach an optimal charge. And in order to derive um, those algorithms, it's, it's totally necessary to combine total system simulations together with precise battery models um, to derive suitable charging strategies. So I'm almost at the end of my talk. Um, let me wrap it up. I showed you that you have different driving scenarios and that they strongly influence how the fast charging looks like. And this is a really complex thing. So in, in practice, you don't have just one cell, but you might have different cell suppliers and you want to analyze like which cell gives me the best fast charging. You might have a heater inside of your pack and it's tough to find out how to heat and in what conditions should I heat how much. And if it's warm, I have my, to cool my pack, but how much should I cool? Then I have aging. So how does aging influence my fast charging? I have a driver that does different things like charging immediately or go skiing and then uh, charging. And you see how complex this is. There are just so many different combinations and there's no way that you can find a solution and, and an optimal algorithm um, just by by guessing or by, by going to a laboratory and perform some measurements. In my opinion, there's only, only one solution. You have to back this up by simulations. That's the only way how you can get all of this complexity um, handled. And to get it done, um, you need total system simulations where you couple um, total vehicle simulations. Like if you do them in CarMaker together with high precision physical cell models like from us. And that's what I showed in, in my talk to you today. Special thanks go to Dr. Pascal Picha from IPG Automotive. He greatly supported me in generating the simulation results I showed you. If you want to watch your like it or have open questions, please do not hesitate to contact me or visit theTimo.com.